I'd like to say hello, good morning, everyone. สวัสดีครับทุกทุกคนครับวันนี้นะครับอยู่กับผมครับมานิสิติมาสนะครับโปรเจกต์ตัวเสจากไทยแท็กครับก็ขอกล่าวคำว่าสวัสดีตอนเช้านะครับจากเมืองไทยแล้วก็ขอให้ต้อนรับทุกท่านนะครับเข้าสู่เวทีซีรีส์นะครับเป็นซีรีส์ที่สองแล้วจากการที่เรามีการคลิปสตาร์ทไปครั้งแรกซีรีส์ที่หนึ่งเกี่ยวกับเรื่องโอเพนเดต้าครับเรื่องสองเนี่ยเป็นเรื่องเกี่ยวกับ artificial intelligence AI สั้นๆนะครับซึ่งเราก็ได้รับ request จากท่านผู้ชมจากซีรีส์ที่แล้วว่าอยากจะฟังเรื่อง AI อยากให้อีกเรื่องเรื่อง AI มาพูดเพราะในปัจจุบันเนี่ยมันมีการใช้ AI ในหลายเซกเตอร์ในสังคมของเราเลยเดียวครับไม่เพียงด้านเรื่องอีเองก็ตามนะแต่ว่าวันนี้ครับเราจะมาพูดถึง AI ในเรื่องของศาสตร์ทางการแพทย์แล้วก็สารสนเทศด้วยครับว่ามันได้ถูกนะไปใช้อย่างไรบ้างนะครับหลายๆท่านถ้าอยู่ในโรงพยาบาลนี้หรือเป็นเหมือนอีเลยนี้นะครับก็อาจจะพอทราบว่าเราหลายท่านอาจจะยังไม่ทราบวันนี้ครับเราจะมาพูดถึงเคสแอคชั่นโตัวอย่างนะครับที่ได้มีการนำเอไอเนี่ยไปใช้ในทางด้านการแพทย์แล้วก็สารสนเทศครับแล้วก็วันนี้นะครับผมได้รับเกียรติอย่างยิ่งเลยนะครับจากอา,อาจารย์นะครับท่านนั้นเป็นนักวิจัยดิจิทัลเชอร์นะครับจากศูนย์เทคโนโลยีเล็กชนและคอมพิวเตอร์แห่งชาติหรือที่ลูกชาติทราบว่าคือเด็กเทนะครับนักเทคโนโลยีเล็กชนแห่งคอมพิวเตอร์เทคโนโลยีเซ็นเตอร์นะครับซึ่งอาจารย์ท่านเนี้ยท่านก็มีความสนใจอยู่ในเรื่องของคอมพิวเตอร์แลงกวิจิกเป็นเรื่อง NLP Natural Language Processing เรื่องของแมชชีนเลอร์นิ่งนะครับแล้วก็ถ้าใครที่อยู่ในสายของดิจิตอลหรือ AI ก็อาจจะเคยได้ฟังเซมินาร์หรือเวบินาร์ของอาจารย์ท่านมาแล้วนะครับวันนี้นะครับอาจารย์จะมาเป็นมอนเตอร์ให้กับเซสชันของเราครับขอเสียงต้อนรับอาจารย์ดรปรัชยาบุญขวัญครับจากเมกเทครับวันนี้ครับอาจารย์สวัสดีครับ Good morning all um, and welcome to the um, second webinar in the topic of AI In health and the quest of empower and the quest to empower our health systems, and for today's session is going to be in Thai and in English, so it's going to be bilingual to, from now. ก็ยินดีต้อนรับทุกท่านนะครับเข้าสู่เซมินาร์ครั้งที่สองนะครับเรื่อง AI ในงานด้านสาธารณสุขนะครับแล้วก็การที่จะทําให้นํา AI ไปใช้ในการพัฒนาระบบสาธารณสุขในประเทศไทยนะครับ And today we have four speakers, um, uh, four distinguished speakers with us. Um, The first, yes, and the first one is Associate Professor Dr. Warapan uh, from Faculty of Information and Communication Technology, Mahidol University, Thailand, and the second one is Dr. Jasper Tom from National University of Singapore and um, Saw so Sui Sok, uh, Saw so Sui Hock School of Public Health, Singapore, and the third one is Assistant Professor Dr. Lisa Lin from. London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and the fourth one and the last one is Dr. Pai San r o m b i b u n s a k from r a c h u v i t i Hospital, um, Hospital Thailand. And um, the session for today will be it um, bilingual, and um, we're going to start from the first speaker, which is um, Associate Professor Dr. Warapan. Um, he's a um, he's an Associate Professor. And a committee member at the Faculty of Information and Communication Technology of Mahidol University. His research topics include computer vision, machine learning, and pattern recognition, biometrics, uh, medical image processing, and image and video processing. He will be um, giving a talk in the title of "AI Trends to Watch Out for Digital Healthcare." So, without further ado, please welcome Ajahn Warapan. Thank you. Uh, Good morning, everyone. สวัสดีครับครับสวัสดีครับขอบคุณครับอาจารย์ I I P ผมเตรียมสไลด์มาเป็นภาษาอังกฤษนะครับแต่ว่าฉะนั้นผมจะขอใช้ภาษาไทยเนื่องจากว่าเรามี translator อยู่แล้วใช่ไหมครับนะครับผมจะขอเริ่มจากการแชร์สกรีนนะครับครับทุกท่านเห็นสไลด์ไหมครับเห็นครับอา
ครับผมก็สวัสดีผู้เข้าร่วมทุกท่านอีกรอบนึงนะครับผมอาจารย์วรพันธ์นะครับจากคณะ ICT คณะ Faculty of Information Communication Technology จากทางมหาวิทยาลัยมหิดลน,นะครับผมจะขอใช้เวลาสั้นๆตรงนี้ประมาณ10ถึง15นาทีถ้าเกินบอกผมด้วยนะครับส่วนใหญ่ผมชอบพูดเกินนะครับเพราะว่าจะชอบเล่าเรื่องนะครับในสิ่งที่ตัวเองได้ทํามาในงานวิจัยแล้วก็ทําอยู่ณนะปัจจุบันนะครับวันนี้ผมจะขอเน้นไปที่ตัว AI สําหรับ medical image analysis นะครับผมขอเน้นไปที่ทางด้าน image analysis เป็นหลักนะครับเพราะฉะนั้นภาคของของแพทย์ที่ผมทําอยู่ด้วยส่วนใหญ่จะเป็นทางด้านรังสีวิทยาศัลยกรรมตกแต่งนะครับรวมถึงจักษุนะครับในในเชิงการแพทย์ใดๆก็ตามที่ใช้ข้อมูลทางด้านภาพเป็นข้อมูลสําคัญในการวินิจฉัยโรคของแพทย์นะครับ AI ทางนั้น image processing นะครับ image analysis เข้าไปมีบทบาทสำคัญทันทีนะครับในปัจจุบันนี้ครับคือผมจะเป็นทางหัวหน้าแ a บของ e m v i t นะครับ Machine Vision and Information Transfer แล้วก็ AI for Medical Informatics ของมหาวิทยาลัยมหิดลนะครับของคณะ ICT ครับท่านสามารถเข้าไปดูประวัติผลงานวิจัยนะครับทั้งของผมเองของแ a บวิจัย Research Group มี international scholar จากต่างประเทศหรือนักวิจัยในระดับปริญญาโทปริญญาเอนะครับที่อยู่ใน home page ของผมเองหรือว่า page ของ lab ได้เลยนะครับผมจบการศึกษาจากที่ออสเตรเลียนะครับจบทางด้าน computer engineering แล้วก็ computer science ในระดับปริโทเอกมาเลยนะครับก็กลับมาไม่ฮิดนได้10ปีก็ทำงานวิจัยทางด้านการแพทย์นะครับที่ใช้ AI แล้วก็เทคโนโลยีเข้ามามีส่วนเกี่ยวข้องนะครับสามารถเข้าไปดูได้เลยก่อนอื่นนะครับผมเป็นคนแรกผมเลยจะขอปูทางไว้นิดนึงสำหรับสปิเกอร์ท่านถัดไปนะครับคือกล่าวว่า AI หมายถึงอะไรนะครับคือ AI หรือ Artificial Intelligence เนี่ยแปลตามตัวเลยคือมันเป็นการจำลองความฉลาดนะครับของมนุษย์เพราะฉะนั้นในเชิงโปรแกรมเมอร์เชิงคอมพิวเตอร์เนี่ย anything สิครับที่ make decision อาจจะเป็น simple decision complex decision anything could be considered as the AI นะครับอย่างเช่น vacuum robot ที่อยู่เดินไปเดินมามีการตัดสินใจเป็น if else statement turn left turn right นะครับ vending machine หรือว่าเครื่องซักผ้าอัตโนมัตินะครับทุกอย่างคือ AI อะไรก็ตามที่มันสามารถจำลองความฉลาดของมนุษย์การตัดสินใจเล็กๆหรือไปจนถึงการตัดสินใจขนาดใหญ่นะครับพอในศาสตร์ด้าน AI เนี่ยจะมีสับแอเรียอยู่ข้างในอีกเยอะนะครับหนึ่งในนั้นคือ Machine Learning นะครับ Machine Learning คือการเรียนรู้ของเครื่องจักรนะครับการเรียนรู้ของอุปกรณ์คอมพิวเตอร์นะครับเพราะฉะนั้น Machine Learning จะเป็นศาสตร์ส่วนหนึ่งของ AI ที่ใช้ learning example ในการให้เครื่องคอมพิวเตอร์เรียนรู้ว่าอะไรคืออะไรนะครับอย่างเช่นผมต้องการให้ให้เรียนรู้ว่าอันนี้คือ cardio m a c d a l y ใน chest x-ray ผมจำเป็นจะต้องมี example of the chest x-ray ที่เป็น cardio m a c d a l y เป็น finding ประเภทอื่นรวมถึง normal นะครับ feed เข้าไปในกระบวนการการเรียนรู้ของ machine learning นะเพราะฉะนั้นเวลาเราทำงานนะครับตั้งต้นทำงานวิจัยหรือตัวนี้เราจะต้องตั้งต้นจากการทำความเข้าใจให้ตรงกันก่อนนะครับเพราะเดี๋ยวจะมีคำถามว่าเอเดต้าพวกนี้ใช้ได้ไหมหรือการทำ Machine Learning หรือ AI ทางนั้น Image Processing เนี่ยต้องใช้อะไรบ้างโจทย์ใดสามารถเป็นโจทย์ที่เป็นไปได้นะครับใน Machine Learning ก็จะย่อยลงมาเป็น Deep Learning Deep ก็คือการเรียนรู้เชิงลึกการเรียนรู้ที่ใช้การประมวลผลและพารามิเตอร์ในการเรียนรู้จานวนมากเป็นการจาลองกระบวนการคิดของมนุษย์แบบซับซ้อนนะครับที่มีเซลล์สมองจำนวนหลายล้านสิบล้านที่ผมไม่สามารถทราบได้เนี่ยคือลักษณะการเรียนรู้แบบ Deep Learning ส่วน CNN ท่านอาจจะเคยได้ยิน Convolution Neural Net เป็นหนึ่งวิธีการที่สำคัญของ Deep Learning นะครับและ MV หรือ Machine Vision คือกระบวนการการ apply AI ML DL CNN แต่ particularly on image and video data นะครับในที่นี้เราจะเจาะไปที่ Medical Image นะครับอะไรเป็น medical image ที่อยู่ในทั้งวิจัยและอุตสาหกรรมทางด้าน AI ทางด้าน medical image analysis บ้างนะครับเดี๋ยวผมดูเวลาแป๊บหนึ่งผมคนพูดเกินนะครับโอเคภาพที่ท่านเห็นนะครับ
หลายๆท่านจะมีความรู้ถึงการแพทย์มากกว่าผมด้วยซ้ำนะครับจะเห็นว่าที่เราทําอยู่นะครับอย่างเช่นเอ็กซเรย์อัลตราซาวด์เอ็มอาร์ไอซีทีสแกนโอซีทีของการสแกนอินโฟเมชันของของดวงตานะครับหรือตัวเลติโนอิมเมจนะครับเพราะฉะนั้นอิมเมจเหล่านี้ครับเป็นอิมเมจที่เกิดจากการทําขึ้นมาเพื่อต้องการวินิจฉัยฟายดิ้งหรือวิธีใช้ดักโนสพวกโรคที่เกิดในร่างกายมนุษย์นะครับเราจะต้องทําการถ่ายอะไรออกมาสักอย่างหนึ่งเพื่อให้เห็นข้อมูลนะครับเพราะฉะนั้นทั้งหมดที่ผมโชว์ไปเนี่ยคือแอคทีฟอยู่ทั้งในแอเรียของวิจัยและแอเรียของอินดัสทรีนะครับผมเลยจะอ่ะโดยส่วนใหญ่ถ้าเป็นข้อมูลทางด้านการแพทย์นะครับภาพทางด้านการแพทย์จะมาในรูปแบบออริจินอลเลยนะครับจากไดคอมฟอร์แมตนะครับพอเป็นไดคอมเนี่ยเราก็จะต้องมีการแปลงภาพนะครับออกมาเป็นรูปแบบของบิตแมปนะครับที่มีพิกเซลมีสีแล้วก็ทำการประมวลผลผมจะไม่ลงลึกมากนะครับแต่ว่าทุกอย่างที่เป็นการ making sense of image and video data นี่ครับมันเกิดจากการ making sense of the color information ที่เรามีในแต่ละ individual single pixel ที่อยู่ในภาพนะครับเราจะใช้หลักการเดียวกันกับการมองเห็นของมนุษย์นะครับหลักการเดียวกันการประมวลผลด้วยสมองอันนี้คือ AI นะครับแต่ข้อมูลสําคัญที่เข้ามาในเชิงการแพทย์ตรงนี้คือไดคอมนะครับไดคอมจะเก็บข้อมูลอยู่ระหว่าง1 2บสถึงสิบิตต่อ1พิกเซลแต่ภาพโดยทั่วไปที่ใช้ในการประมวลผลจะอยู่ที่8บิตนะครับเพราะฉะนั้นมันสําคัญตั้งแต่การแปลงไดคอมตั้งแต่ตัวไดคอมเองสแตนดาร์ดไดคอมก็จะเป็นหนึ่งในงานวิจัยที่ทํากันอยู่นะครับแล้วก็แปลงตัวไดคอมออกมาเป็นข้อมูลภาพที่พร้อมใช้ในการประมวลผลด้วย Machine Learning อันนี้คือ Introduction ใน AI ของ Image Processing นะครับของทางด้านการแพทย์อ่ะผมจะขอไปที่ตัวอย่าง Use Case Scenario รวมถึง Research Topic ทางด้านอ่า Research Topic ด้วยมันมีมันมีเยอะครับผมขอดึงขึ้นมาที่เป็นหัวข้อสำคัญนะครับหัวข้อสำคัญที่เราทำอยู่ใน Medical Image Analysis คือ classification หัวข้อที่หนึ่งการแบ่งประเภทนะครับเหมือนกับแพทย์ต้องการวินิจฉัยว่าคนนี้เป็นหรือไม่เป็นเป็นเป็นที่ stage ที่เท่าใดคือโจทย์ของ classification โจทย์ที่สองคือ segmentation หรือ lesion localization ถ้าเป็นแล้วบริเวณของโลกอยู่บริเวณใดหรือผมสนใจความผิดปกติของออร์แกนส์หนึ่งในร่างกายผมต้องการทราบถึงรูปร่างหรือเชฟนะครับมีในแชทผมไม่แน่ใจเป็นคำถามจากทางบ้านไหมนะครับอู้เหลือห้านาทีเหรอครับโอเคเข้าใจว่าผมได้มาสิบห้านาทีโอเคครับอ่ะก็ไม่เป็นไรครับก็เอาเร็วๆนะครับให้ให้เราได้เห็นภาพรวมร่วมกันก่อนนะครับแล้วก็มีเรื่องของ reconstruction เรื่องของ NLP นะครับแล้วก็เรื่องของ t e l e m e t r y g a m e VR AR แล้วก็ MR นะครับจะขอไปเร็วนิดนึงผมเตรียมมาสิบห้านาทีแต่จริงๆน่าจะได้พูดประมาณสิบนาทีนะครับโอเคครับก็ในโจทย์ classification นะครับตัวอย่างที่เป็นอ่าโจทย์ที่ผมทำอยู่ในหลับวิจัยทำอยู่แล้วก็มี AI solution ที่มีการใช้บ้างแล้วนะครับทั้งแบบ official แล้วก็ unofficial นะครับแล้วอาจจะเคยได้ยินข่าวที่ Google กับราชวิถีนะครับหรือหลายๆโรงพยาบาลเริ่มมีการลองที่จะ implement หรือ deploy จริงคือตัว diabetic retinopathy บน retinal image นะครับมันเกิดจากการเริ่มตั้งแต่การ detect ว่าคนนี้เป็น dr หรือไม่เป็น dr นะครับถ้าเป็น dr แล้วจะเป็นที่ stage ที่เท่าไหร่นะครับของความรุนแรงของ dr นะครับวัตถุประสงค์คือเราต้องการที่จะค้นหานะครับตอนแรกที่ผมได้โจทย์มาเมื่อสิบปีที่เราจะเป็นโจทย์ลักษณะว่ามันมีมีการอ่านภาพที่ไม่เพียงพอหรือคนที่เป็นโรคเบาหวานจะต้องมีการ investigate ในส่วนของ dr เนี่ยที่ที่ที่จะต้องถี่เพราะถี่ถ่ายภาพถี่แต่อ่านไม่ทันมันก็เกิดการขาดความต่อเนื่องในการฟิลเตอร์ความรุนแรงที่อาจจะไปสู่การตาบอดได้นะครับเพราะฉะนั้นตัว DR detection ก็จะเป็นตัวอย่างหนึ่งนะครับสำหรับการทำ classification มันมักจะคาบเกี่ยวกับการทำ segmentation ด้วยเพราะการระบุ stage ของ DR จะไปคาบเกี่ยวกับสัญญาณโลกที่ปรากฏในรูปแบบเฉพาะด้านนะครับในบาง solution จึงทำการ segmentation ของสัญญาณโลกก่อนแล้วทำสัญญาณโลกนั้นมา classify เป็นสเตทของโลกอีกครั้งหนึ่งอันนี้คือตัวอย่าง
ะครับที่เรามีอยู่ตัวอย่างที่สองคือ classification ในเรื่องของการประเมินความผิดปกติของอตัว bone edge นะครับก็คือพัฒนาการของเด็กนะครับว่ามีพัฒนาการของกระดูกเนี่ยเป็นไปตามอายุจริงหรือไม่นะครับเด็กสิบขวบพัฒนาการกระดูกอาจจะอยู่ที่หกขวบนะครับเพราะฉะนั้นก็อันนี้ดูได้จากาการทำเอ็กซเรย์ของของโบนอย่างเช่นบริเวณของมือนะครับมีแชทมาไม่รู้มีคำถามผมเหลือเวลาสองนาทีครับผมจะไปเร็วๆแล้วอาจจะพูดอะไรไม่ได้แล้วนะครับก็อ่าอย่างเช่นหรือโควิด -19 นะครับก็เป็นตัวหนึ่งที่เราทำโซลูชันขึ้นมานะครับสำหรับการอ่าคลาสิฟายว่าเป็นโควิดหรือไม่จากตัวเชสเอ็กซเรย์แล้วก็การเพิ่มความมั่นใจของแพทย์นะครับเพราะว่าส่วนหนึ่งนะครับในการทำคลาสิฟายเออร์เนี่ยคือแพทย์จะมีคำถามว่าเราจะเชื่อถือโมเดลนั้นได้อย่างไรนะครับว่าเฮ้ยคุณบอกว่าเป็นดิอาสเตตสามคุณบอกว่าเป็นโควิด1 9ความมั่นใจให้กับตัวระบบของ AI อยู่ที่ใดนะครับเพราะนั้น AI จะเป็น black box มาก่อนแต่เราพยายามที่จะดิกเอาออกมาว่าโอเคในบริเวณที่เราใช้ในการ classify เนี่ยตกลงแล้วมันถูกเอ็นเพอร์ซายหรือถูกดึงข้อมูลมาจากบริเวณนี้มันก็จะหลีดเข้าไปสู่การเซกเมนเทชันหรือพวกรีชั่นโลคอลไลเซชันนะครับผมขอไปเร็วๆนะผมไม่มีเวลาเลยก็ตัวนี้คือการทำอ่าออแกนเซกเมนเทชันนะครับการทำวอลลุ่มอ่าเซ็นออโต้เซกเมนเทชันเพื่อดูว่าอ่าในส่วนของบริเวณหลอดเลือดช่องท้องนะครับผมจะดูบริเวณว่ามีเชฟอย่างไรมีวอลลุ่มเท่าไหร่เพื่อติดตามพัฒนาการของการรักษาหลังผ่าตัดหรือการทำพีโอเปอเรชันในการศึกษาถึงเชฟและรูปร่างในการผ่าตัดนะครับหรือตัว CTR ผมข้ามมาแล้วมีตัวนี้ตัวนี้สำคัญผมขอใช้ดูเป็นตัวอย่างคือการดู finding ลักษณะสำคัญที่เป็นตัวการระบุโลกในเชฟเอ็กซเรย์นะครับปัจจุบันเทคโนโลยีมันมาถึงสเตจที่ว่าผมใส่เชสเซ็กซเลยเข้าไปนะครับผมอ่าตัว AI เนี่ยจะสามารถระบุได้ว่าเป็นฟายดิ้งเท่าใดนะครับเป็นฟายดิ้งอะไรนะครับด้วยความมั่นใจเท่าใดแล้วก็เจเนเรตคัลเลอร์แมปในการระบุว่าฟายดิ้งเหล่านั้นน่ะ AI ดูมาจากบริเวณใดนะครับแต่ผมจะไม่มีความรู้ทางด้านการแพทย์มากเพิ่งเจเนเรตมาจากโปรแกรมเมื่อมีกี่วันที่ผ่านมานะครับตัวนี้จะบอกว่าเป็น infiltration ด้วยความมั่นใจ 82% แล้วบริเวณคือจะอยู่บริเวณปอดด้านซ้ายและด้านขวาบริเวณเหล่านั้นมันจะไม่แบบ exactly แบบ 100% นะฮะแต่ว่ามันจะเป็นไกด์ไลน์ในการบอกว่าเราดูจากบริเวณเหล่านี้เพราะฉะนั้นอุปกรณ์ AI ทางด้านการแพทย์เนี่ยส่วนหนึ่งจะใช้ในการ pre filtering หรือใช้ในกวดลักษณะของ assistive tool ของแพทย์นะครับหรือใช้เป็นอุปกรณ์ในการทำ learning หรือ training สำหรับแพทย์ที่เข้ามาเป็นผู้เชี่ยวชาญใหม่ในสาขาวิชานั้นๆน,น,นะครับมีมีเรื่องราวอีกมากมายที่อยากจะเล่าให้ฟังอีกส่วนหนึ่งในส่วนของ reconstruction ทั้งหมดที่ผมกล่าวมาคือเป็นผลงานจาก lab วิจัยของคณะไอซีทีมหาวิทยาลัยมหิดลน,นะครับภายใต้ lab ที่ผมลีดอยู่ส่วนนี้คือเป็นส่วนการทำ reconstruction หรือ enhance พวกภาพนะครับการทำ MRI เนี่ยสมมติว่าใช้เวลาสิบนาทีแต่เราคิดว่ามันนานไปนะครับเราไม่อยากให้ให้คนไข้อยู่ในอุโมงค์นานเราจะทำการปีดอัพสี่เท่าแปดเท่าเคยเป็นแปดนาทีจะเหลือหนึ่งนาทีนะครับเราจะเล่นที่ข้อมูลของ Frequency Data นะครับกระบวนการของ m อ m i Machine เราจะรู้แล้วว่ามันมันมันมันเป็นเรื่องของความถี่นะครับแล้วเราก็จะมีกระบวนการในการแปลงด้วยเทคโนโลยีของ s t e n s ของ g r a p a ปลงมาเป็นข้อมูลในเชิงของภาพที่เป็น Spatial Information และแพทย์ก็จะได้เห็นเพื่อจะมีที่ฉายโลกได้นะครับเราใช้คอนตัวซีเนนเดอร์ดีฟเลอร์นิ่งเนี่ยในการสร้างภาพที่เป็นสปาเชียลฟอร์เมชันเพื่อลดเป็นกระบวนการลดความเร็วในการลดความช้าเขาเรียกว่าอะไรสปีดอัพเดอะโปรเซสต์แกนนิ่งตัว m อ i m a c h i n e นะครับแปดเท่านะครับฝั่งซ้ายจะเป็นฝั่งที่ตัว AI เราเจเนเรตออกมาฝั่งขวาจะเป็นในส่วนของอที่ได้จากฟูสปีดนะครับที่ที่แบบ
มาช้ากว่าเรา8เท่านะครับเพราะฉะนั้นตอนนี้อยู่ในระหว่างการ make sure ว่า information ที่ i extract ออกมาจากตัว speed up 8เท่าเนี่ยยังสามารถ keep information ของรอยโลกได้จริงหรือไม่นะครับในส่วนโครงสร้างปกติไม่มีปัญหานะครับปัจจุบันก็จะเห็นพวก startup ออกมาจากทางเกาหลีทางจีนบ้างแล้วนะครับครับก็มีเรื่องในส่วนของ NLP ด้วยนะครับในของ AI ผมขอไปเร็วๆนะครับการทำ AI ในการอ่านข้อมูลภาพโดยอัตโนมัติแดงในสิทธิ์รีพอร์ตผมพยายามที่จะเจเนเรตแดงในสิทธิ์รีพอร์ตด้วย AI อัลกอริทึม AI โปรแกรมนะครับ without human expert นะครับหรือลักษณะของเทเลเมตนะครับผมก็ได้ทำความร่วมมือกับหลายหลายที่เลยนะักศึกษาทำการรักษาทางกายทำอุปกรณ์ทำใช้ image processing ในการสร้างอุปกรณ์หรือทำ mobile application ในการสื่อสารในการส่งผลที่เป็นด้านการแพทย์นะครับเป็นลักษณะของเทเลเมตแล้วก็สุดท้ายจะเป็นทางนั้นเกม VR AR นะครับใช้ AI เนี่ยในส่วนของ rehabilitation ทั้งพิการทางสมองพิการทางด้าน body physical body นะครับก็ใช้ AI เข้ามามีส่วนทางด้านการแพทย์ในการทำ rehabilitation เพื่อ maintain ศักยภาพรวมไปถึงการเทรนบุคลากรการแพทย์การเทรนนักศึกษาแพทย์การใช้ VR MR เทคโนโลยีในการช่วยในการผ่าตัดทางกายหรือการรักษาและวินิจฉัยโรคโดย reference บน real body นะครับจาก segmented information that we get from the AI in image processing นะครับทั้งหมดทั้งมวลเนี่ยต้องใช้องค์ประกอบหลายด้านนะครับทางด้านไอทีความร่วมมือกับแพทย์ผมจะไม่สามารถนั่งอยู่คนเดียวแล้วทำทุกอย่างที่กล่าวมาทั้งหมดเนี่ยได้คนเดียวนะครับมันเริ่มต้นจากการคุยกับแพทย์แล้วก็ทำงานร่วมกันนะครับตลอดระยะเวลาสิบปีก็เลยได้ผลงานเหล่านี้ออกมาครับผมขออภัยในความอาจจะดีเลยไปนิดหนึ่งนะครับดังนั้นขอจบการนำเสนอในเทคโนโลยีและ Advanced Technology ทั้งนั้น Research Startup แล้วก็ในส่วนของ Tools ที่ถูกใช้แล้วนะครับที่เห็นอยู่นะปัจจุบันเนี่ยทางด้าน Medical Image Analysis นะครับขอบคุณครับ Thank you very much อาจารย์วรพันธ์ Um, I really wish we have more time for you because your your talk is really interesting, and um, I'd like to hear more about from you. Um, but anyway, um, we're going to move on to the next program, which is um, the talk from Dr. Jasper Trump from National University of Singapore, um, in the title of AI in Cardiovascular Disease: From Development to Implementation. Um, and without further ado, Jasper, the stage is yours. Great, many thanks. Let me just uh, share my screen. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah, very good. Yes. Great. Hi, everybody. My name is Jasper. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Public Health uh, at the National University of Singapore, and I'm very excited to share with you uh, some of the advances that we've seen uh, in AI in cardiovascular disease, but also some of the troubles that we've encountered in implementing some of these solutions in clinical practice. So these are my disclosures. So, you know, heart disease is becoming an increasingly bigger problem globally, and this is just data from Thailand because I'm speaking to a Thai, Thai audience today. Uh, and one of my really good friends uh, uh, at the University Hospital in Bangkok published his paper last year, showing that especially among elderly. The number of uh, hospitalizations for heart failure is uh, consistently increasing, even in Thailand. So the problem with these type of patients, and many patients with heart disease, is that they have worse outcomes than many forms of cancer. Um, and the problem is also that they're often very expensive. These patients get hospitalized often. They go in and out. They use a lot of expensive medications. So they put uh, significant pressure. On the health system, so there are important gaps between what we know what works and what we do in clinical practice, and this has been highlighted by uh, many organizations, among which uh, the, this is an example from the American Heart Association, that across the patient pathway, from having a risk factor for cardiovascular disease all the way down to developing cardiovascular disease like heart failure. Uh, and ultimately, unfortunately, uh, having to to receive supportive care in the end of life phases, there are important important gaps that we're we're seeing in both diagnosing and treating these patients. 
An example is that we often fail to diagnose 20 to 40% of heart uh, attacks in patients with uh, high-risk cardiovascular disease. And 20% of patients with hypertension, at least in the U.S., remain undiagnosed. And these percentages are even higher here in the Southeast Asian region, including in Thailand and Singapore. So some of the challenges that we see is that we, we know very well how to diagnose cardiovascular disease. Actually, we know how to treat it. You know, treatment for hypertension has been around for decades. It's been extremely effective. Uh, we know it prevents further disease. We know it prevents death, but we're not uh, reaching the right patients. And this is due to important gaps in the health system. So we don't have enough finances to cover the drugs. We don't have enough manpower to see and diagnose patients. Uh, we don't have enough available drugs locally in pharmacies, uh, especially in rural areas. And I think it's within these sort of gaps in the health system that digital health solutions, particularly AI, can play an important role to fill them to reach the right patients with the right treatment. So I'm just going to highlight some of the some some small examples of what we've recently seen in, in heart disease, and one that I've been involved in personally that is actually reached implementation. So this is one of the first um, studies I'd like to highlight. This is called Marker HF. So this was a uh, risk prediction model. And as the previous speaker highlighted, uh, AI can be used for different uh, uh, goals. One is actually to pre uh, uh, predict risk. So which patients are li more likely to die or get hospitalized and which are less likely to die, get hospitalized. And that was the aim of this study. And in this particular study, the authors uh, were able to predict those who are most likely to die after three years uh, uh, compared to those who were not based on just eight variables, namely uh, diastolic blood pressure, uh, some uh, variables uh, that they got from the laboratory uh, 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 of these patients. And using only these eight variables, they were able to predict outcomes with an AUC of 0.88. So an AUC in this case is a measure of accuracy. If it's one, this model would predict with almost 100% or with 100% accuracy. In this case, an AUC of 0.88 is very high. So we always know for sure that if a patient is a high risk, according to this particular model, that in real life, this patient is likely to die or be hospitalized. So the unique thing about this particular uh, study was that it focused a lot on data quality. They made sure that the data that they used to treat these models was of the highest possible quality by looking at uh, outliers, cleaning the data, making sure that the date at which these data were measured were uh, similar at the same date and closest in this case to discharge for these patients. So one of the important lessons that we've got from this particular study was that if we want to do proper AI and we want to have usable AI, we need high quality data. And I think that's a challenge in many cases. So the previous speaker also highlighted some of the, the efforts that we've seen with AI in medical imaging. So this is a study that I was involved in or actually led, published in, in Lancet Digital Health. So for heart disease, one of the most important modalities to diagnose patients is cardiac ultrasound. Similar to what we use for pregnant women, we use in this case an ultrasound device to look at the heart, to see if it beats as well as it should, and pumps are on blood uh, as we expect it to do. So normally, uh, uh, a sonographer or cardiologist would uh, perform cardiac ultrasound and then manually annotate uh, the ventricle. So that's a cardiac tra chamber here, which often causes a lot of time and effort. Uh, we've developed um, algorithms to, to take over that task, which then automatically annotates uh, the cardiac chambers using deep learning algorithms. I'm just going to play the video, which we can then also project live on the heart. So the red uh, annotation here was actually done by the algorithm. And you can imagine that based on that, we can derive all sorts of parameters and cardiac function, which actually tells us if this patient is sick, yes or no, and also what the potential prognosis is of this patient. 
So we've also validated this for multiple uh, parameters, and I'm not going to go through this in detail because I imagine that uh, most of you would not be interested in very detailed echocardiographic parameters. But what we've seen when we compared uh, uh, 23 echocardiographic, so cardiac ultrasound parameters, to, to three independent cardiac sonographers, that the difference between the automated and the three independent measurements for each parameter was less than the differences among the three sonographers. So this, in other words, means that the AI algorithms were interchangeable with what we normally see with expert human sonographers. And this led actually to an FDA approval of these algorithms for clinical application. So how does this work for implementation? You know, it's really great if we have a nice software, but how do you implement it? And especially in regions where there is an unmet need. So this is the human study that currently uh, is ongoing, but actually recently completed enrollment uh, performed in Tunisia. So the human study uh, dealt with an important unmet need in Tunisia where there are too few physicians to diagnose heart disease. So what we did is that we equipped nurses using a task shifting protocol uh, with a point of care cardiac ultrasound device that you can see here. So we've seen that uh, in previous studies that nurses or other people, medical students who have very limited experience with cardiac uh, ultrasound can be taught relatively quickly to acquire high quality cardiac images. The challenge is often how to interpret these images. And that's where you often need a trained uh, cardiac sonographer or cardiologist. And that's especially here uh, exactly what's not available. So in this case, we combine these point of care ultrasound devices with the AI algorithms, and we enabled nurses to go to the patient's home to diagnose heart disease. And then we compared that automated diagnosis with the diagnosis done by the cardiologist several days later. Mm -hmm. So this study is currently so ongoing, so I don't have the results yet, but we already know that in 70% of the cases, we are able to assess the cardiac function with uh, uh, relative uh, certainty. That means that these nurses are able to acquire images in such a way that we can measure them. And we've seen in the previous study that the automated measurements are often interchangeable with manu uh, manual human measurements, which means that we'll likely see, or hopefully, but fingers crossed, uh, that this will be effective in diagnosing heart disease. So, Another thing I'd like to highlight, and this, I think this is one of the challenges that many people, especially working in clinical medicine, and, and I'm originally a, a physician myself, uh, often don't see or understand is that we treat the evaluation of many of these interventions as traditional drug trials. So we try to treat them as a placebo versus, uh, versus a drug, but we see often that these interventions are complex, meaning there are many moving parts. It's not simply an A versus B comparison, uh, there are many things that can, can go wrong in the implementation. So for example, if we take the human study, it's not just testing the algorithm. We actually need nurses to acquire the images and to acquire them in such a way that we can analyze them. And then if we even think ahead, right, and this is anecdotal evidence that we've captured from our study, uh, is that some patients, especially those in poorer households, were very reluctant to allow nurses into their home out of feeling of shame because they felt that they lived in housing that they did not want to share with anybody else. So meaning in actual real world implementation, all of these factors matter, whether it will be uh, not only cost effective, but also cost effective. Secondly, one of the challenges is that we need to think about how do we validate these algorithms? So this is a, a, a recent meta-analysis which shown that out of, only, uh, uh, out of only 10 records uh, were of the deep learning validation studies were randomized clinical trials, and only very few of these studies prospectively evaluated these algorithms in an independent way against human experts. And I think this is critical because most publications that we've seen so far do what we call an inset validation. So they have their own data set, 
which has already been collected. They split it up in two, two different parts. They develop it in one part and validate it in their own data set uh, um, uh, in, in the other part that they left out. And the challenge is that we, we, we've seen that if you then take it to, let's say, a different hospital, a different country, right, or even a different continent with peoples with different body sizes, ethnicities, it might not work as well as you would have seen in your own data set. So I think this is one of the main challenges that we face now within AI. Then there's significant issues with implementation. So I've had the privilege to lead the, the World Heart Federation uh, Digital Health Roadmap, and this is one of the key pieces of evidence that went into that, uh, together with, with uh, a survey that we've held uh, among patients and uh, practitioners. And we've seen that especially clinical practitioners are reluctant to use new uh, uh, devices because they often lead to an increased workload and responsibilities. Many nurses, physicians are extremely busy. They add to that, you know, they have to do some additional thing, uh, input more data, things that they don't have time for. Uh, in a lot of the cases also, uh, the technology has proven to be unreliable. And this is, a, 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 again, this is from a meta-analysis. Out of the total number of studies found, 10% of these studies reported that having unreliable technology or a lack of perceived evidence uh, uh, was an important barrier for clinicians to start using the technology. And a, a, a big factor in this is that often these technologies are one-off interventions. They only do one thing. Uh, you know, they're one app. So that means that, let's say, if you're a, a cardiac patient, and, and I speak to some uh, within the course of my work, sometimes they have to have five different apps for five different risk factors. You know, the, it becomes very challenging for for both patients as well as uh, practitioners to keep up with the different apps. And when they're not very well integrated with your your EHR records, it actually uh, creates even more work for the physicians to transfer data over. So all of these things together uh, cause significant issues to implement them. So within this study, they also then made some recommendations, which means that we need to capitalize specifically on co-design. And I think this is critical. So we need to take patients and physicians along when we design these uh, uh, interventions and also policymakers, because they need to be cost effective or they need to save costs at least to be implemented. Uh, we need adequate validation of these technologies, but this also means that we need to realize that many of these are complex interventions. So some of them are not able to be tested in a randomized clinical fashion like we do with drugs. Uh, we need to make sure that your know, data privacy and security policies are adhered to, and they need to be uh, integrated with the existing medical records so as to not cause uh, um, more, more work for physicians. I think on the reimbursement, the financial side, uh, I think there's also two really important ones that they need to be priced fairly to represent the value add that they have. But importantly, we need to also think about reimbursement. So even in Singapore, where I live uh, and work, which is considered a rich country, a high income country, currently we only reimburse telehealth. So for any other thing than telehealth, there are no official reimbursement pathways. And this is the case in most countries. Even in where I'm originally from in Holland, we don't have a clear reimbursement pathway except for telehealth. So that means sustainability of many of these interventions uh, uh, is in question. So we often see many pilot studies and sometimes even successful trials, but then there's no real uptake in day-to-day in, in -day clinical practice. So finally, I'd like to shout out, and, and this is because I'm a bit biased, uh, uh, the World Heart Failure recommendations and what we need to do to actually improve implementation. Because I think within the cardiovascular space, and the previous speaker highlighted this for other areas as well, we've seen that many AI solutions are effective. You know, they can do a lot of and take over a lot of repetitive tasks from uh, doctors and nurses. Uh, they can enable task shifting, and they can essentially free up time from doctors and nurses to finally care for the patients rather than do these repetitive tasks that most of them are doing right now. The challenge is though that we need to invest in, in digital capacity of the health workforce. They need to know how to use these type of devices. They need to get used to using them uh, and they need to get enthusiastic to use them. But we also need to invest in digital literacy of patients. So we need to make sure that patients understand 
what these devices are used for, what their benefits are. And this is especially a challenge because in NCD, in cardiovascular disease, a lot of these patients are elderly and have, uh, in some cases, some form of cognitive dysfunction. Uh, we need important and new regulations for, for patient privacy and safety because these devices use a lot of data. Uh, in a lot of situations, uh, it's not clear what the implications are for patient privacy and safety. Um, we need to uh, ensure sustainable financing, like I mentioned. We have uh, a poor track record of reimbursing these technologies. Uh, and then we also need to focus that they don't cause additional health inequity. And this is especially because patient-facing technologies mm -hmm. often don't reach the weakest patients or the most vulnerable ones, the, namely those with limited digital literacy, those with limited uh, economic means to access some of these technologies, especially things like apps. Some people don't own smartphones, and these are often patients, the people who most often come to hospital who are sickest because they have a, a, a larger number of risk factors. So with that, I'd like to summarize, I think we've seen some very uh, amazing progress in AI in cardiovascular disease. And I think we really have the potential to move more care to the patient's home, uh, fill in gaps in the health system. Uh, but we, I think we need to recognize when sort of evaluating them that they are often complex interventions, many moving parts that we need to take into account to assess potential real world uh, effectiveness uh, and we need to rigorously externally validate these algorithms, uh, which needs to happen continuously, I might add. So even after implementation, we need to make sure that uh, uh, they keep doing what they're supposed to be doing because algorithms often develop over time. Uh, and, but importantly, we also need to address some of the implementation barriers that we see, uh, including uh, 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 better integration uh, with clinical uh, uh, workflows uh, as well as a reimbursement for some of these technologies. So and with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Jasper. Now we, we are um, going into the question answering session, which is going to last about five minutes. So um, has anyone any question? You can post the question in the chat box and I'll read it out for you. สำหรับท่านไหนนะครับที่มีคำถามนะครับสามารถพิมพ์คำถามเป็นภาษาไทยได้นะครับแล้วเดี๋ยวผมจะแปลเป็นภาษาอังกฤษได้นะครับไม่
Um, she would like to know whether how can we implement an AI model so that we can propose we can um, promote the health equality and equity. So um, I'm going to pass this question to Jasper first. I think that's yeah, it's a very interesting question. If we could implement an AI model to identify or, or promote health equity. So, I mean, you could, if you're very clear on how you define equity, and I think that could be across multiple axes, you could implement a model that could predict inequity, who is most likely to, to suffer from inequity in that sense. Um, I think if you're you're talking about how you know for the implementation part, how can we promote uh, health equity? I think well, it begins. It, this is actually across the life cycle of AI products. I think the you know during the development phase, you know we often see that especially those that reach market are uh, developed in 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 high income regions, U.S. you know Western Europe. I, I think that's. You know, that's the regional inequity, if you if you will, because we need regional AI to work for our patients here. Uh, so that's in the development part. Then there's in the implementation part, and I think here governments play an important role. Uh, we need to see how we implement them uh, and who uses them. So you know, once we evaluate them, we need to be very sure, and that's why we need to treat them as complex interventions with the full what we call a public health process evaluation. We want to make sure that uh, you know people who, who have the potential uh, uh, to use them are not excluded. So we want to make sure that uh, we don't exclude elderly uh, uh, women, uh, people from socioeconomic households. And then, you know, going forward, if you, you take them to market, you want to make sure that uh, governments provide uh, equitable, equitable reimbursement, essentially, because it's often, unfortunately, a money issue. Uh, and that often also needs to go uh, together with investing in digital literacy. Uh, in Singapore, we, we have an active program investing in, in digital literacy for the elderly, for example. Uh, I'm not saying it's it's perfect at all. Absolutely, there's there's a lot of challenges, but you know, simply implementing these kind of algorithms, especially when they're patient-facing, uh, we need to recognize that they need to go with some of these programs, I think. Uh, but I hope that answers your question very well. Okay, and um, thank you for your answer. I, I think that's that's quite insightful. Um, it de it really depends on the country. So if it's a developed country, um, you can implement the AI model in in some way to help bridge the gap between the age. Um, but for the developing countries, it's going to be a different case. So yes, I, I, absolutely. I'm just to add to that. I think you know some of these solutions might not work everywhere, like you just mentioned, yeah. and, and in some cases, you know, we've seen in sub-Saharan Africa studies published where actually very simple algorithms actually make a really huge difference and also easier to implement because they're easier to implement. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And we've got two more questions from the audience, so the questions keep coming. Okay, um, one question is especially for you, Jasper. Um, how can we ensure that the AI system will really help the medical staff to work more efficiently? Yeah, so I think there's there's an important role here for co-design. Co uh, um, yeah. you know, there are a number of co-design principles and, and frameworks. Uh, ISO uh, organization, ISO has a, has a framework for that. I think, unfortunately, uh, you know, at a very early development stage, I, I, I would hope that people who work in, you know, designing AI interventions talk to clinicians, policymakers, and patients very early on, because often we see sort of solutions for problems that are not there. Uh, you know, so you, you really need to think about that from very early start. That's one of the recommendations we also included based on sort of our, our deliberations in the World Heart Federation Roadmap. Mm. So, so really co-designing, I think, is key uh, yeah. to make it easier. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I do agree with you. Yeah, co-design would be, would be the way to go for the developing countries. And um, we've got some more some question. Uh, we've got some more question from the audience, too. And I think this question is meant for Ajahn Wadapan. So um, the question is, if we were to implement some of the AI machine for disease diagnosis in low and middle income countries, is it possible to reduce the medical costs for patients comparing to the traditional way of medicine? Okay, um, thanks. That's a very good question. I also want to answer the previous question. เพราะว่าเอ่อผมผมอิมพลิเมนต์พวกนี้ในประเทศไทยนะครับเอ่อจริงๆแล้วเนี่ยเราความเหลื่อมล้ําหรือหรือการเท่าเทียมทางด้าน
จทย์ในการ implement นะครับเราต้องแยกว่าเทคโนโลยีนี้หรืออุปกรณ์นี้เราจะทําเพื่อการ advance ในเชิง AI ส่วนเทคโนโลยีนี้เราจะทําเพื่อลดการเหลื่อมล้ําเพราะฉะนั้นเวลาพัฒนาเทคโนโลยีครับมันจะเป็นไปตามวัตถุประสงค์นะครับเพราะเราต้องการลดความเหลื่อมล้ําเราจะต้องศึกษาบริบทเหมือนที่ดรแจ้งนะครับคือเราจะต้องการศึกษาบริบทก่อนว่าไทยเนี่ยมันมีบริบทของ 4G 5G อินเทอร์เน็ตหรืออย่างไรหรือไม่นะครับเพราะว่าถ้าบริบทของแต่ละประเทศไม่เหมือนกันเราแอดซูมว่าโอ้อินเทอร์เน็ตคุณมีแอคเซสในยูเอ็นไทยแลนด์นะอย่างเงี้ยก็จะไม่ได้นะครับมันมันจะมีลิมิเคชันว่าแอคเซสได้แต่อิมเมจวีดีโอฟอร์เมชันได้หรือไม่เขามีเงินในการเติมอินเทอร์เน็ตหรือไม่เพราะฉะนั้นที่สําคัญที่สุดในการความเท่าเทียมนะครับคือเราต้องมีวัตถุประสงค์ที่ชัดเจนตั้งแต่การเริ่ม implement project นั้นๆนะครับ for the second question regarding the implementation this is a very good question it's actually similar to what we I I answer the previous question like um we we try if we get a question like this we start with the uh challenge and limitation of each scenario for example okay we need to implement the machine learning model in a very good machine what about the people in like uh countryside that they don't have a good machine so we try then to decide the central unit central processing unit okay if they cannot access on one single central unit we're going to have a multiple central unit Uh, in the different regions of the country, like that. So there's so many ways that we can implement the advanced technology in the way for the middle income or low incomes by using the advance of the technology in another side. So each particular project will have like different way of implementation. We have to talk about that in case by case. But we we are doing that right now. Okay, thank you very much for insightful answer. I think that's that's the way to go, and I really um, appreciate your attempt to bridge the gap in Thailand. So um, I'm sorry, but the the time for a question answer session has been um, limited. So now we have to move on to the next program. So on the next program, we have a talk from Assistant Professor Dr. Lisa Lin from Faculty of Epidemi. Epidemiology and Population Health, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, United Kingdom, and the title of her talk is "The Role of Vaccine Chatbots in Reducing Vaccine Hesitancy: uh, Lessons from This Study in Asia." So, without further ado, please welcome Dr. Lisa. Thank you. Hello, hi. I just want to make sure my microphone is yes. working. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Let's see. All right. Give me one second. <laughs> I'm looking for presentation mode. Are you able to see the screen, or are you able to see the notes? Um, we can see your screen, but not the notes. Okay. Great. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thank you very much for all the present uh, presenters before me. Actually, uh, there were some points that I was going to bring up, and then uh, that already covered by uh, the speakers, which is fantastic because I'm looking forward to read uh, the publications. Apparently, I think we have. You will find that in my presentation that we actually come to the same conclusions uh, regarding the like, participatory approach, and then also uh, co-working with the. With the healthcare providers, etc. So uh, this is fantastic, and thank you for inviting me to this panel. Uh, hopefully, my presentation will be useful to you. Um, so today, I will be. Uh, my name is Lisa Lin. Uh, I'm currently based in Hong Kong, actually, uh, co-leading the vaccine competence project at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and also a program that. Uh, 
uh, that aims to develop and evaluate digital solutions to tackle vaccine hesitancy uh, in uh, these for each liberatory of uh, Data Discovery for Health, which is uh, funded by Hong Kong University. Um, so uh, I will be presenting a study that we are recently completed in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, the study aimed to assess the effectiveness of conversational AI services, which are chatbots, on COVID-19 vaccine confidence and acceptance. It is a multi-site uh, RCT, uh, randomized control trial in uh, Thailand, Hong Kong, and Singapore. So to the best of our knowledge, this is the first multi-site randomized control trial studying chatbot's effectiveness in improving vaccine attitudes and uptake. Our study targeted over 2,000 adults in this region who were uh, the guardians of seniors and children who were not vaccinated at the time of study. Uh, these adults should be uh, directly and or indirectly making vaccination decisions for vaccine hesitant populations. So we focus on age groups that are uh, that have the highest level of vaccine hesitancy against COVID vaccines or the lowest uptake in each country uh, study locations. So the study period was from February, uh, February earlier this year, cover all the way to June 2022. Eligible participants were randomized, uh, ran randomly assigned to either the control or intervention group with an allocation ratio of one to one. Uh, I understand that um, this, this slide is probably not uh, this uh, eligible for the audience, but then other slides will be available later on after this presentation. And then, uh, and more details and potentially corrections will be available uh, later this year through publication. Um, participants were asked to complete the pre and post intervention surveys, and they were asked to use the pop chatbot if assigned to the intervention group. So this is the uh, chatbot for Thailand. Uh, the name of the Chepa was Cheshore. Um, Cheshore was developed by the Minister of Public Health, the Thai Health Promotion, uh, Promotion Foundation, Facebook Thailand, HBOT, an international health policy program, and the National Vaccine Institute. This is a product of a strong private and public partnership with experts and health authorities backing. This is a chatbot uh, focused only on COVID vaccines. Uh, the content, uh, this is developed by a Hong Kong team uh, based at Hong Kong University, uh, collaborating with Vaccine Company Project. Um, the information and dialogues in the chatbots were tailored to the local context and delivered in the mainstream local languages. This and also the Cheshore uh, chatbot. So uh, it was operating in Thai, uh, in Thailand in English, traditional Chinese, simplified Chinese in both Hong Kong and I think traditional Chinese and English in Singapore. So the, uh, the chatbot content uh, covered vaccine importance and necessity. Why are we taking the vaccine? Why is it important? It's also covered vaccine safety, all the questions and concerns around COVID vaccines. It covers vaccine effectiveness, uh, how effective it is against Delta against uh, the, the new Omicron virus variant, for example, how how to get vaccinated. So this is uh, all the questions regarding access access to vaccines, yeah, and uh, so what we call the convenience issues. Um, there are also tips before the vaccination, tips after the vaccination, and uh, and one category that focus only on debunking COVID vaccine related misinformation. So in this study, we focused on the vaccinated, popu on vaccinated population as of February 2022. At the time, the vaccine has been available for uh, almost a year, eight to 12 months, depends on the country. Uh, when we began the RCT, vaccine policy was strictly enforced and uh, the vaccine uptake in all three study locations started to increase sharply in response to the emergence and spread of Omicron. Mm. A combination of highlighted risk perception owing to increased daily case count in the local setting and the public measure, uh, public health measures uh, that are as uh, elevated, such as school-based vaccine rollout 
and vaccine mandates, uh, which all uh, have led to surges in vaccination uptake in our study locations, which actually was fantastic news for public health agencies, but then it was leaving us uh, with a small population who remained unvaccinated during our study period. Therefore, precisely in this study, we tested the effectiveness of COVID vaccine chatbots in improving perceptions of COVID vaccines, intent uh, and attitudes uh, to be vaccinated among the most vaccine hesitant groups in Thailand, Hong Kong, and Singapore. Those who resist the policy and the programs till the very last. So, Today, I'll be pre uh, given the time I'll be presenting only uh, of results from Thailand arm. Presented here is the first RCT, which included parents of ambassador children aged 5 to 11 years. Chatbot using parents, we found, have higher confidence in chatbot importance and effectiveness in the intervention group. So they are um, much more likely to say agree or strongly agree to the statements regarding COVID vaccines are important, COVID vaccines are effective in reducing severe conditions um, and are effective uh, regardless of the manufacturers um, and are at least three times more likely uh, compared to their counterparts in the control group saying that uh, COVID vaccines are effective against all variants which are fantastic news uh, that we found. Um, we also found that uh, chatbot using parents also reported better access to vaccine-related information and vaccine acceptance. They are more likely to uh, agree with the statements that it is easy to find information about COVID-19 vaccines. Um, actually, they are twice as likely compared to their counterparts. And they are also more likely to agree that my child will get vaccinated if many others are vaccinated, also twice monthly. This is the uh, key findings that we uh, draw from the second RCT, uh, which focus on adults uh, with undesignated uh, senior parents or grandparents who were aged 60 years or above at the time of the study. Um, we were looking at uh, Chaba users who are more likely to, we found that Chaba users are more likely to have been able to debunk misinformation. They are uh, less likely to agree that COVID vaccines were approved without completing clinical trials. However, we also found that by users with the most hesitant senior family members were less likely to agree with a vaccine mandate. So this is the uh, workload that we uh, extracted from uh, Cheshore. Uh, this presented questions and text entered by uh, chatbot users in Thai and also uh, in English. Thank you to my collaborators who are actually uh, participating in the audience. Actually, I would like to say, uh, I think that as a few highlights from this core cloud, um, you can see that the most asked questions are, how am I at risk of COVID-19? Um, so this is about, it's a question about risk perception, which actually drives uh, what we've seen drives the use of child COVID uh, vaccine chatbots and also actually a key de determinant of the uptake of vaccines. Um, they also asked about if I had the COVID before, should I be getting the vaccine? So you can see that uh, a lot of questions come from um, out of the assessment of the personalized risks. Um, and then they also, the Cheshire were also able to respond to questions like what are the symptoms of the COVID uh, and then uh, where can I get tested, for example. So here's some highlights that we've learned from this RCT. So uh, this RCT was the first to conduct in three Asian regions, um, one being the upper middle income country, which is Thailand, and two being a high income regions, uh, which are Singapore and Hong Kong. As this study was conducted during the aggressive implementation of containment interventions, such as social distancing rules and mandatory vaccine pass by the government in our study sites, um, it employed the RCT design, which considered a very robust study uh, to evaluate the impact of chatbots 
our most hesitant populations. Chatbot development and evaluation were con uh, continuously and constantly updated throughout the study period. It was tailored to uh, including Cheshire and also the Describe for Age bot chatbots. They were tailored to changing local epidemic situations and vaccine policy and programs. For example, during the study period, uh, if you, some of you can remember, uh, it, came, it came with the approval for the uh, 5 to 11 age group vaccinations. So we had to go back to the chatbot and quickly update to reflect the newest policy. And in order for us to disseminate the most timely and accurate information. So chatbots accommodated the most used languages on the most widely used communication platforms in the study site. So in addition to tailoring the language and to the context, we also need to identify the most widely used communication platforms uh, in the local, uh, local setting. So for example, uh, Cheshire was hosted on Facebook Messenger in Thailand, um, and then we used WhatsApp as a study platform uh, for, for the, for the chatbots in Hong Kong and Singapore. And these chatbots were developed by trusted this, uh, leading public health research organizations or government agencies and most of, the, most of the time both in the city site. So we also adopted the REM framework for uh, process and um, outcome evaluation, which reported high uh, acceptance among stakeholders, uh, which are healthcare professionals, policy makers, and local uh, the target audience. And uh, the chatbots were proven to have strong scalability, which means that it could be scaled up to cover other regions or uh, to, we are thinking to cover other types of vaccines post COVID. Um, we also ensure the questionnaires, the study instruments were standardized to the extent possible across all countries and uh, involved in the study so that uh, it will improve our uh, ability to compare outcome variables of interest across region and across context. Mm -hmm. So uh, to date, um, very few studies have pre uh, that we found uh, through literature review have uh, rigorously investigated the effect effectiveness of chatbots, especially in, um, in promoting vaccine acceptance or behavior. Um, so finding from this RCT uh, reported an increase in vaccine acceptance and confidence among some chatbot users, um, but with, with exception to the most resistant ones. Um, and the study, the findings is uh, valid across all three study, uh, study sites. And we actually have five study groups uh, that cover seniors and children. Um, so study, uh, evidence from this study supported that um, well-designed and implemented chatbots can have positive influence on health behaviors. Um, we found that, for example, uh, in Thai health group uh, that focus on children, interactive conversations with chatbots contributed to parents' increased vaccine confidence. That's, uh, that's uh, showed in the, show up in the data. Our chatbots were also hosted in the most uh, popular uh, mobile messenger apps, Facebook. Uh, Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp, which uh, shed lights in uh, shed insights on potential ways to harness social media and online engagement to drive vaccine confidence and uptake. We also identify uh, potential backfire effects. So this is uh, this is some research, uh, from some, uh, uh, existing research that suggests that in some certain circumstances, pro-vaccine messaging deliver, delivered through social media can be counterproductive. For example, there may have been specific safety concerns or misinformation narratives that particular uh, group either social demographic groups or, uh, or other study groups that have been less aware prior to the study or prior to the use of social media. And then, however, during the process of engaging these, um, these users with chatbot or social media then actually may have increased their familiarity with the topics and or narratives. And we also found some emotional uh, pushback uh, from the most resistant groups against like pro-COVID uh, vaccine messages. 
So here, uh, these are what we conclude as uh, implications uh, for future chatbot development and for uh, uh, future studies. We have found uh, that carefully thought out uh, frequent like FAQ Q&A interaction um, that address the most frequently asked questions could be no less effective and actually sometimes more effective than um, the free text conversation mode. Uh, I, uh, just like the previous presenters, I think the, uh, we need to have more advanced uh, AI technology, machine learning, and natural language processing technology that uh, these are currently still rely heavily on human analysis. Um, at least to machine uh, to train the machine, and then from time to time we spot errors in their responses. So therefore, uh, in our study, we actually switch back and forth between uh, different modes just to see that which one is more effective in producing uh, satisfactory uh, and responses that are satisfactory. We also found that health chatbots should ideally be embedded in existing health services platforms to maximize uh, the utility and usage. It should be supervised by trusted health experts to ensure information accuracy and actually with, um, with timely update. And it's, uh, I think also uh, echo with the previous presenters that we, uh, we also have to be trusted um, supervision so that it complies with data security regulations and ethics guidelines. In terms of contents and delivery, we suggested that uh, chatbots uh, future development can uh, adopt an emotion-based approach and then uh, even to share personal stories. These will allow uh, users to uh, to to uh, to I think it will it will allow the chatbot to convey reassurance uh, to users and to alleviate their doubts and fear and uh, potentially to be more persuasive in online communication campaigns. Um, we also uh, suggest that that uh, it should be in, it should not be a standalone. Uh, intervention, like the other uh, person who was saying that we suggest that it should be part of a more multi-level, multi-prone approach, a complex intervention that uh, to health uh, communication. For example, it could be delivered in combination with webinar series, with like uh, health uh, FNQ or Q&A sessions with uh, healthcare professionals, or it should be embedded in trusted websites such as patient uh, medical service portals. Um, but in conclusion, we do found that uh, chatbots can be used as an uh, essential component of patient service portal that is available to, to the public 24-7. It could save time and energy of healthcare professionals. It could provide information that are repetitive, um, be asked. Um, it could triage needs before directing users to a human aid. So this is my funding acknowledgement. Uh, the project is uh, primarily funded by Vaccine Confidence Fund and then also the, uh, the uh, Hong Kong-based Innovation and Technology Commission. Um, it is, we also, uh, our partner, ITAP Group, was also supported by grants um, from the SS and Delivery Partnership, also by UND, uh, UNDP and the Japanese government. So this is my contained information and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Lisa. Um, I think we've got to take the the questions from the audience to the to the discussion panel panel discussion session instead. So yeah, you've got you've got some question too. So yeah, so yeah, please wait Thank for you. that. Okay. Um, so on with the program. We have um, a distinguished talk from Dr. Paisan Rombibun Suk, and he's a um, clinical professor at College of Medicine, Rangsa University, and also Ratchaviti Hospital, Bangkok, Thailand. Um, the title of his talk is Learning from Global to Local AI Implementation for Diabetic Retinopathy Screening in Thailand. So without further ado, please uh, welcome Dr. Paisan. Swadikap, Ajahn. Swadikap. Swadikap. Hi. Hi, everyone. I would like to thank HITAP Thailand for giving me this great opportunity to, to share the experience on AI in this webinar. Well, actually, I modified the title of my talk a little bit to be a real-time screening for the adaptive retinopathy uh, using deep learning. Is it ready for the real world? I don't have any financial um, interest in what I'm going to talk in my presentation. Well, um, Thailand is one of a few countries in the world 
that we have a um, uh, nationwide screening program for adaptive retinopathy, which is uh, supported by the government. We have a population of 70 million people, but we have um, four to five million patients with diabetes per 1,500 ophthalmologists and 250 retinal specialists. Too bad, but um, 90% of the patients are not in Bangkok, but 50 percent of the ophthalmologists, including renal specialists, they're in Bangkok. Therefore, we need to use um, mid-level ophthalmic personnel and also the non-mid-level uh, ophthalmic personnel as trained screeners. Their main tests actually are not for adaptive retinopathy screening. Their main tests are assistant in, in eye clinics and the uh, management in um, the non-communicable disease unit in provincial health offices. However, we try to train them and to try to have the accuracy of the trained screener for retinal photo grading for screening DR at 85%. And this screening program is well established since 2013. And we target to have like 60% of patients with diabetes screened in Thailand. However, um, this is from 2019. Uh, each bar represents each of the health region in Thailand. You can see only five regions in Thailand approached the all past the 60% uptake for adaptive retinopathy screening. For the whole country, uh, the average uptake for screening is only 50%. Well, uh, back in 2016, uh, there came this breakthrough paper of using deep learning mm. for adaptive retinopathy screening using retinal photographs. This is a paper from the Google Health. Um, well, uh, they developed a model from data sets in the US and India, and they validated the data set um, the algorithm from the data set from UK, and they found that both sensitivity and specificity for detecting referable adaptive retinopathy was more than 95%, which is very robust. And this is one of the most cited articles in the recent medical literature until now. So we had a chance to, to uh, validate the algorithm in the nationwide, nationwide screening program in Thailand. And this is a paper that we uh, conducted with them and published in NPJ Digital Medicine in 2019. In this paper, we performed retrospective validation. Uh, we're using um, retinal images, more than 25,000 images from uh, more than 7,000 patients from every health region in Thailand, as you can see from, from this um, table. And here's the result from the retrospective validation. Um, if you would like to detect referable retinopathy, the sensitivity of the trained graders in Thailand uh, is at 74%, but for deep learning is 97%. But for specificity, the grader in Thailand has like 98% uh, compared to 96% from the deep learning. So sensitivity is kind of lower than AI, but specificity is a little bit higher. So based on the result, I think it's quite, it's quite robust in Thailand. So we move on to, um, to conduct a prospective validation of this algorithm in nine primary care units in Thailand. Uh, totally, we have uh, almost 8,000 patients in this prospective validation. And here, the workflow of this prospective study, we have patients who came to the clinics in those uh, nine units, they have to sign a consent to participate in the uh, prospective study first, and then they're gonna have their retinal photos taken by the nurse. And the nurse is gonna upload the, the photos into AI in the cloud, and the results gonna give back right away. So that's the reason why we call real-time screening. And uh, all the images are gonna be read, overread by the retinal specialist as well. And if the patient has positive from the screening, it means uh, they have like side-threatening depth retinopathy, they're gonna be referred to tertiary care hospital in uh, the same region. Well, uh, we are able to publish um, this work, real-time retinopathy screening in Thailand's uh, nationwide screening program in Lancet Digital Health early this year. And here's the, uh, the main result from that prospective paper. In detecting site threatening retinopathy, you can see uh, we compare with the local retinal overreader in this study. So specificity, positive predictive value and negative predictive value is quite similar between deep learning and our local retinal specialist. But for sensitivity, deep learning is kind of higher. It's at 91% compared to 85% uh, for the local retinal overreader. However, well, um, if you take a look in the literature, although that the retinal screen screening is at the forefront of uh, AI in medicine, there are only a few papers on real-world screening. 
using deep learning. Well, uh, this paper is from the UK, published in um, British Journal of Ophthalmology in 2020. Another real-world study is from the Australia, uh, published in Scientific Report in 2021. And this is another paper from, from China, published in um, BMJ Diabetes um, Care uh, 2020. If you compare these four papers, studies, including Thailand, uh, the number of patients in the UK is kind of like uh, pretty high. It's more than uh, 30,000 patients. In Australia, they conducted in only like 236 patients. In China, it's a huge. So <laughs> there's more than uh, 47,000 patients. In Thailand, we have almost 8,000 patients, as I mentioned earlier. If you have a look in terms of performance, sensitivity, and specificity, um, I think the study in Thailand has the highest overall at 91.4 and uh, sensitivity and 95.4 specificity. For the rest three papers, sensitivity is quite high at around 90%, but the specificity is, is become lower. This is uh, what we found in the real world study. However, there are some challenges because in the UK, uh, they conducted a kind of systematic screening just as Thailand. It means the whole adaptive population is the target the same as Thailand. But for Australia and China, they conducted a kind of opportunistic screening. They didn't aim to screen all the patients. And only the study in Australia and Thailand has a kind of qualitative study. And here's the qualitative, qualitative study that was conducted in Thailand. Uh, we assess um, human acceptability of uh, using AI in um, the screening in Thailand. And well, it turned out uh, based on the questionnaire that we asked patients and the screeners, they are quite accept of using AI. And this paper is presented at the Conference on Human Factors in Computing System in Honolulu, Hawaii in 2020. However, um, well, there's still um, many important remaining issues for real-world deployment of deep learning for adaptive retinopsis screening, as uh, Dr. Jasper and some other speakers said before, it's the same thing. Well, um, the thing is, well, um, even though we use AI, um, patients who have positive from screening, they actually didn't go to, to see a doctor that much. Well, based on our prospective study, we found that only like slightly higher than 50% actually go to see doctors. So I think the main question is, can deep learning improve the referral adherence. Um, we, we are studying this in Thailand. And uh, can uh, deep learning improve screening uptake? In Thailand, we have only like 50%, and our target is 60%. And we'd like to scale up deploying of deep learning for the whole country. Um, we're going to scale up deep learning in Thailand in a few months. And the last thing is health economic evaluation in the country's context is very important. Just like the, the question from the audience asks about cost of AI. Well, I think health economic evaluation is needed in each country because each country is different in terms of economy. And well, um, um, you may see a lot of studies report only sensitivity and specificity kind of parameters. However, the success and sustainability of uh, deploying deep learning AI does not rest on the accuracy but it may rest on the, the means to improve local healthcare system. I think that's very important then, uh, accuracy parameters. How is deep learning fit into the current clinical workflow? I think that's a very important question. You, you want to use AI as a standalone, or you want to embed AI into the hospital operating system? And do you require all readers to read all the results of AI, do you believe them? Or you just only use our reader to read a, a, a portion, only positive cases? I think those are uh, questions that we need to answer. And here are steps of uh, applying AI for the screening in Thailand. We mm. conducted retrospective already. And we conduct a kind of pilot prospective study already. And we aim to uh, integrate AI into our nationwide screening program. And we're going to conduct a kind of, we call it implementation research in October this year. It means two months from now. Well, in summary, uh, deploying AI in clinical practice may be the last, but uh, I think it's a difficult step in the translation of medicine, just like other branch of, of medicine. Um, AI algorithm should at least be prospectively validated of robust performance before deployment, just as Dr. Jasper said before, well, um, there are not too many papers have external validation. Not, I mean, 
didn't count on the critical deployment. Well, um, the success of deployment may rest on factors beyond accuracy parameters, such as implementing into the current workflow of screening, or uh, may rest to the adherence of referrals of the patients. Uh, this is my acknowledgement. I'd like to thank uh, HITAP once again for inviting me, and well, I'd like to answer every questions that you may have. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you very much for your, your um, distinguished talk. Um, it's, it's been really insightful. And for now, we are moving on to the panel discussion. Um, but due to the, li the limitation of time, so um, we are limited to ask you guys, all of you, for just only one question. But I'm going to ask one question, and then you you um, you answer the question regarding your your own opinion, okay? And the question is very very simple, but it's also very insightful. The question is, what health system challenges are beyond the scope of digital health and AI? Yeah, it is really really interesting. Um, so we are now looking forward outside the, the boundary of AI. So what would be the, the challenges in the health system that, that is beyond the scope of digital health and AI? So let's begin with Ajahn Warapan Kap. Okay, that, that's a very difficult question, right? And I'm not sure that I understand the question correctly or not. <laughs> Um, beyond the AI, right? Um, like all speakers have mentioned that the deployment of AI is a very difficult part to to do. So in, in many perspectives, you know, not only on the accuracy performance, the current technology, the context of each area that we're going to deploy, but it's also involved in the educational background people, um, like the readiness of the uh, people and also industry on investment to make it more accessible in the bigger area and more importantly on the policy move of each country as well. So, I mean, the technology of AI is going to be ongoing as it is and going to be more advanced when we have the big breakout of the hardware. You know, before we cannot do things like this, we cannot learn parameter in like a mm -hmm. hundred or thousand million parameter in a few minutes because we don't have the machine. But the machine also growing up, we're going to have a better machine, more advanced machine. Now we are on 800, 800 Apollo, and yeah, we're going to have more next year. So the breakthrough of the machine equipment, we're going to have the better ability of the AI. It's going to be more advanced. And also we need the investment and also the policy support. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yes, that's a very... Uh, that that has actually widened my horizon. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Atan Kap. Okay. So let's move to Jasper. Um, should I repeat the question once again, or you can? No, I think I'm. I mean, I'm clear okay. on the question. Of what what uh, health system challenges are beyond AI? I think um, yeah. you know, finance seems to be very short to these challenges. Uh, financing there are AI algorithms that can help with financing, billing, or you know. But I, uh, actually reimbursing uh, patient-facing technologies is a challenge. I think, uh, uh, you know, it's one of the key challenges, I think, leading to lack of sustainability, uh, as uh, uh, the distinguished last speaker also pointed out. I think it's a huge issue. Yeah. Right. Mm, yes, the finance is the key here. Yes. So, yeah, beyond the infrastructure, the hardware, the software, the finance is also very important, and that supports the development of AI and those system. So, um, yes, uh, so let's move on to Lisa. So what's your opinion about the questions, and um, do you have any solutions for that? Mm. That is a tough question, uh, and thank you for uh, for the audience who asked this question. Um, so, I uh, coming from a behavioral and social science background, uh, I will be looking at this from almost like a human element perspective, uh, and therefore I would say that uh, AI could potentially address some of the most uh, critical issues around equity, for example, and inequalities. However, in many other ways, it also widened mm -hmm. the disparities. Um, and therefore, I would say that, so um, I would say that if we 
use it wisely with proper implementation and um, stakeholder support, we'll be able to uh, provide information and uh, even in improve capability in the uh, traditionally underserved uh, communities. However, that we also looking at, for example, the new digital determinants of health. Mm. So for those who it also it started to create new barriers for some people, as we see during COVID, when everything switched online, and then uh, and there is a there is a group of children that have benefited from it, but a lot of them actually losing track of what should be taught in school and then what should be learned, and this also so this is given us new challenges in terms of how to tackle equity and uh, equality issues. And then this also set up for my next comment is that the human touch of the interaction. So how much can you, uh, how much time, how much attention can you put on the screen? Right, we see that in children um, that do not have the space in the house to use digital interventions uh, during COVID. We have children that for example, cannot stay focused looking at the screen for extended periods. So uh, that means that we create another barrier for uh, children development and child development. And this is just a uh, one population. We also look at seniors, uh, for example, therefore our chatbot studies focus on this particular two groups. Uh, and the reason why we had to use their guardians as proxies exactly for the same reason, because they are not as active and not as reachable through uh, AI and digital innovations. And therefore I think these are, and, um, and then I think beyond that then, uh, again, coming from a social science and behavioral backgrounds, then I would say that there are still like important human interactions in the, the entire human development from the uh, childhood and to like um, to the elderly stage. This cannot be replaced by AI. I hope one day when I need help in the senior homes, I will not be interacting with like with uh, AI supported robots. Instead, I would prefer to see a real person. Yes. Uh, so I think these cannot be replaced by AI. And I don't know if even with the best technology, if this will ever be resolved. Or is it some, a question that we want to, a ch challenge we want to resolve? I'm not sure. But I would just say that there are still boundaries um, within what the technology can bring as a solution to human lives. Over. Wow. Thank you very much. You you have also widened my horizon once again. Um, okay, so uh, let's move on to Ajahn Paisan. Kap, do you have any comments on that question? Well, yeah, yeah. I think well, if we like to um, improve the health system beyond AI, well, I think uh, actually is um, I think the system that improve access of patients into AI. Because, well, um, if you have AI, it's going to be useless if patient cannot get access to it. So, mm -hmm. well, yeah, I think, yeah, I, and I think Dr. Warapan and um, Dr. Lisa also mentioned about accessibility. I think that's a very important point. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. I see. Thank you very much, Kapatan. Um, so I think we've got some more time for one, one more question. So, um, so I have selected this question from the audience. Okay. So okay. what are the, the enablers and barriers for adopting or implementing AI for health in low and middle income countries? Um, so let's begin with Atan Warapan. Um, okay. Uh, let me think about that a bit. Maybe yeah. go to Ajahn. Well, I, I, yeah. well I, yeah, yeah. I, I, it was the last, but I can be the first here. <laughs> yeah, 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 thank you, Ajahn. <laughs> well, yeah, I think, well, the, the enabler should be the government, I think. Well, um, for example, yeah. just, yes, for example, of the, the, for the DR screening in Thailand, the government mm -hmm. helps us a lot. Well, um, we had the screening program in place, and we used a twin screeners before and the government support of setting up the uh, the key i mean the key indicators of having less 60 percent of patients um uh, screen and um the government also support to have the the cheap but um efficacious medication which is because it's about in a world national list of essential medication for treatment of diabetic macular edema i think that's very important however well um the the disabled may be even though the government support this, if the patients and actually our screener, our personnel didn't accept 
to AI, I think it's going to be quite difficult. So I think we have to have all these pieces of puzzle in place for right. getting AI to move on. That's okay. my opinion in the, yeah. well, um, the country that have you see user coverage for all the patients. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Tapatan. And Lisa and Jasper, do you have any comments on that question? Oh, so I, I, there's actually a couple of systematic reviews looking into this, or specifically in this context. I think right. what we found in our digital health roadmap actually adds to that. Uh, you know, if you look at patients, they need to be able to afford it. Uh, they need to be able to interact with it if it's a patient right. uh, facing AI. So that means that they need to have the skills to use it. Uh, and it needs to be relatively easily available. And the providers, it's, 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 it's I think very simple. Generally, that it, it shouldn't add to their workload. Seems to be the major barrier across the board. If it have more work, they, they, they don't want to do it. Uh, you know, they need to be able to, to, you know, willing to adopt new technology. So they need to see that it's effective. So there needs to be adequate evidence. And then, you know, if it's a, a provider facing technology, they need to be adequately reimbursed for it. And right. Then, you know, yes. So, you know, and above like a sort of a larger health system level, there's of course like, you know, the reimbursement issues we spoke about, but in a lot of regions, and this might be uh, not everywhere in Thailand as big of an issue, but in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, it is very technological issues like you know internet connectivity uh one of the major issues for for uh in a lot of regions if you have applications that have to connect the internet it's not always that great um you know so so you know so combination of those i think would be be sort of the barriers in an area, so you know. yeah i do agree with you yes that's the infrastructure and also the financial support. Yeah, reimbursement, always the key. Okay, so Lisa and Atan Warpan, do you have any more comments on that? Uh, I can jump in with a very uh, small point. Uh, just, I, uh, it's actually relevant to the infrastructure, but I was thinking more about uh, stakeholders and the context of local support. Uh, I think the training and getting buy-ins from local uh, government officials, healthcare workers are extremely important. Sometimes uh, from our experience in the rural settings, uh, it actually could com be community leaders that plays a significant role in getting the infrastructure going, even like adoption of new intervention or new technology. So we could, for example, I would say that to go beyond that barrier is that something we could potentially uh, leverage on like behavioral uh, change technique. For example, you use like peer effect, use modeling effect, allowing people to learn from each other, make it, make it fun and interesting, um, or working with local school, for example. So these could be uh, potentially helping us to like go get through the barriers and then potentially uh, increase adoption. But uh, I echo with uh, all the points that the previous presenter is saying that finance is a key. You don't, you know, you can't do anything without, without support. You also need the infrastructure, the technology, uh, maybe all the um, uh, program implementers that have to, for example, get funding to provide devices locally and internet is extremely helpful. Um, we also know that there are some devices that will require less uh, I think, that, what is that? It's not broadband, but probably less like internet support for like basic uh, functions. So uh, there are more things that we, uh, maybe we need more technology to support low technology uh, to, mm -hmm. to a better uh, use of internet connectivity, for example. Yeah. So, uh, so that would be um, my response. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think about a pan cup. Uh, yeah, to, 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 to answer that question, I think it's depending on the, the type of AIs. I mean, but mm -hmm. it reminds me of one of the projects that I used to in, deploy the AI in terms of telemed um, to, to the hospital and to, to the patient. So actually to make the program or the software or efficiency of the AI to be in the ultimate goal that they want to achieve, it has to be the interactive mm -hmm. and, you know, partnership between the patient and also the um, medical co-worker so but as we know that they have a heavily workload each day so at the first time that I deploy that system into the hospital they don't want to use this or they're less active on using the AI program and then it's make um, like the patient or don't want to continue using that because no feedback no answer no mm -hmm. active and then the program will dry out 
So what I have to do and what the team have to do, we have to modify or we have to merge what their routine works into the AI system that I create. I I have the objective on what AI that I'm going to serve, but I will not create additional program or additional functionality for them to add mm-hmm. the workloads, you know, but I will add my AI into their um, routines. That, that's better. So so now they come back to actually because that's what they have to do every day and the program now on life and everyone use that. Yep. <laughs> Oh, wow. Thank you very much for your kind responses, all of these speakers. And um, I would like to wrap up this session for now because we are running out of time. So sorry. Um, but anyway, we have um, listened well, to the... Um, yes, yes, please. Wow. Yes. So I, I have a question here addressed to me directly. Can I address that? Yes, please. Yeah, only one question, I think. Well, um, uh, an audience asked me if... Uh, in my experience, did you see a positive uptake of using AI for screening in rural setting, uh, especially among the healthcare workers in the absence of a motive like national screening program? Do they still use AI for, for the uh, screening? This is a very good question. Well, uh, it seems that well, um, um, this is a kind of mandatory of screening they are in, in Thailand because this is a kind of national program. I think, well, for having AI, it's gonna, it's gonna help them because they may not need to do the uh, kind of um, image grading by themselves anymore. Uh, they may have uh, AI to help them so they can do something else like assist in eye clinics and um, maybe do their regular works in the non- non-communicable disease unit in provincial offices. I think even though, well, uh, you take this out from the national eye screening program, I think they're gonna still use AI. Yeah, it's gonna ease their workload. Uh, I see. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Ajahn. Ajahn Kap. Wow, that, that is very insightful. I've never heard about it. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I'm, I'm going to wrap the session right now. So thank you very much for the speakers for um, coming to give a talk to us. Um, I mean, in Thailand and also worldwide. And I'm going to pass this stage back to the MC. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, very much, Dr. Pachita Bukon from NETEC. And also, very special thanks to all of you speakers, Dr. Warokan, uh, and Dr. Jessica Brown, and then Dr. Richard Lee, and also Dr. Pachita Bukon for today's session. Very interesting and insight, which we have all learned a lot from this session. Um, I'm really sorry for the time delay. And yeah. So for the next session, uh, what it would be is still a secret, but if you have any request for our amazing team, please please, please give us a heads up or an email or drop us a line saying what you want to learn more about uh, the digital health in the country and beyond. All right. And for today, I just like to thank you for both of the audience and also for the speaker and the listener. And until next time, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.